The Chicles, a country church, Marion, Texas, a short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to John chapter 11, beginning at verse 45, and those who can and will, we stand in honor of the Lord and His Word. John 11:45. Then many of the Jews, which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. And some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. <clears throat> then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for your power, for your presence here this morning. May our hearts, our minds be open to receive all that you have for us. And may men and women and boys and girls be drawn to you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. And his people said, Amen. Amen. Greet one another before you're seated. Thank you for coming. What a blessing. And this morning when I was thinking about Jesus being the center of everything, us expressing our love to him, I thought about the young man that was trying to convey his love for his fiance in that manner. And he said, honey, I love you so much that for you I'd climb the highest mountain. I love you so much that for you I'd swim the deepest sea. I love you so much that I would cross the widest desert. And I'll be over Saturday night if it doesn't rain. <laughs> and I, I think some of us as Christians that we express our love for the Lord in like manner. Well, this morning... Some one thing and some another. And as I was studying to conclude this chapter, uh, a verse popped into my head. It may be a little out of context. In, fi in fact, it might be a lot. <laughs> and if so, I'll apologize. But the verse that came to mind was found in Acts chapter 19, verse 32. And while it has to do with the Ephesian craftsmen, it really speaks to a lot of people, a lot of churches, and a lot of circumstances. The Bible says in Acts 19.32, Some therefore cried one thing, and some another. 
For the assembly was confused, and the most part knew not wherefore they were come together. Now that could be the picture of a New Testament church. This can speak to us and to other churches. We, we cry about different things, but we don't cry in unison. Is that a fair statement? Maybe Brother Dave could lead us in that, and he could say, and a one, and a two, and a three, all together now. Wah! <laughs> and when we complained or cried, we'd all be in harmony. We'd all be doing it together. For the assembly was confused. In other words, if we're not united around the word of God, if we're not a united around the blood of Christ, the blessed hope that we have in Jesus, we will be confused. And you can come in confused and you can leave confused if you don't receive him. And knowing not why we come together. Why are you here? Why am I here? Meaning and purpose. But it's all about Jesus. <coughs> so the remainder of this chapter really is all about Jesus concerning him. Some believed and some didn't. And that condition exists today. Verse 45 says, and some believed on him. Many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, <coughs> believed on him. And I think a lot of people would call this leading with a positive. And there was a translation that rendered it a turnaround. And some believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, in their life there was a turnaround. They were going in one direction and they were believing one thing and they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and they turned from their sin and they turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a turnaround in their life. They were going one way. <clears throat> they were skeptical. They were critical. They were judgmental. And now all of that had evaporated for them because they had realized and recognized and received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. Once again, Jesus amazed everybody around him. How does he raise Lazarus? What kind of man can bring life out of death? And it takes a while for some of us for the light to come on. This man can transfer a life. This man, even today, can take somebody from the guttermost and lift them to the uttermost. This man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing that song, probably not enough, but only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can cleanse your heart and make you whole. And some believed on him. Now I'm glad I'm one of the some. Are you? One of the some. Because all my life, I believed that Jesus existed. There was never a time in my life that I did not believe that Jesus was a historical figure. I even went so far as I never doubted his part in creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I never doubted. I, I, I didn't believe in evolution ever. I didn't believe in theistic evolution ever. I believe that in the beginning, God created. I never doubted the crucifixion. Where I went to church, there was always a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. <laughs> See, I, I didn't realize that the cross is empty, that the tomb is empty. Nobody ever told me that I, if I repented of my sins, receiving Christ as my Savior, that he could transform my life. And that I could know without a shadow of a doubt that if anything happened to me, that I'd go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. And some of whom I'm one believed on him. 
But for every part, there's a counterpart or a counterfeit. And the Bible says, and some spoke out of contention. Verse 46, and some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. In other words, they told on him rather than testifying of him. They tattled, in other words. And, and you know, it would, be, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad. You know, who... Think about this, for, and, and I know I've got a sick sense of humor, but if you're going to tattle on Jesus, who are you going to tattle to? <laughs> you know, it's one thing to testify of the Lord. It's another thing to... If you're going to tattle, who are you going to tattle to? The Pharisees, give me a break. The chief priest, he's the high priest. Hebrews 6.13 says, For whom God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Who are you going to tattle to? Yeah. Revelation 10, when the angel testifies what's going to take place during the tribulation, he swears by him who liveth forever and ever. There's nobody else that you can go to. I have uh, people who tattle on Jesus. Really. They'll come and they'll say, Brother Butch, the reason I don't come to church is I asked God for a favor. And God didn't grant the favor. And so I'm not coming. I'm going to punish him. You know, it'd be funny if it wasn't true. It'd be because somebody has been disappointed in God. And don't tattle to me. You can testify all you want of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. But don't think tattling's going to get it because there's nobody greater that you can tattle to. Maybe I ought to say it again so somebody I get an Amen. Paul wrote in Philippians 1.16, The one preached Christ out of contention, not sincerely, hoping to add affliction to my bonds. In other words, they preached out of contention. In other words, <clears throat> their, pre their preaching was to pro provoke rather than to edify. It was to provoke rather than to build up. You ask yourself the question, is there anybody like that today? Listen, every cult I know says something about Jesus. They just pull it out of context. They'll say something about it, but it's not to point you to salvation in Christ Jesus alone. It's rather to dupe the innocent and the ignorant and substituting something, a false doctrine, rather than the Lord's Christ. Now, in verse 47 and 48, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. You can tell who they were. They were Baptists. They had to have a committee. <laughs> and they said, what do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans will come and they'll take away both our place and this nation. I, I kind of think that there are some people this morning who are experiencing the same struggles. In other words, we don't know what to do with him. What do you do with the Lord Jesus Christ? You have to do something. You're not going to be neutral. Either gonna, Jesus said, whoever is not for me is against me. Will I give my life to him? Will I make a real commitment? How much of Jesus do I, I really want? Because we all have that decision to make today. What do we do? We can't ignore him. 
They, they said, this Jesus has done so many miracles and so many people have seen the miracles that we can't just sweep this thing under a rug. What do we do? They were perplexed. How do we handle this situation? Let me tell you something. If we don't do something, everybody's going to believe on him and then we won't be politically correct. We may lose our benefits. We may lose our tax exemption. We may lose our position in society. In society. We can't have that. They were more concerned with the temporal than with eternal life. Better to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season than to experience eternity with the Lord Jesus. You know, there is such a subtle movement to reduce the name of Jesus. Yes. You know, I look at, the, at, at on, on television and it talks about the food bank. And everybody says, you know, as you all give to the needy and everything, you, you need to, to avail yourself to all of the product from the food bank. Do you know that when you take that product from the food bank, you're testifying that you can't talk about Jesus? Because not everybody believes in him. And I'll tell you what, I'm so thankful for a people that will pay for the groceries. We get a direct shipment because telling people about Jesus is more important than anything else. What am I going to do with Jesus? Now, it's interesting that some share the truth unaware that they're sharing the truth. <laughs> Caiaphas. He said, nor consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he would gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Now this is an unbelievable passage. Caiaphas speaks truth. Caiaphas spe uh, speaks a prophecy without being aware of the significance. The chief priests are upset. The Pharisees are all upset. This Jesus is going to start a revolution and men are going to believe on him and they're going to follow him. And, and Rome is going to come down on us like a duck on a June bug. That's the Eichel's translation. You probably don't find it in yours. <laughs> but listen to Caiaphas, the high priest. He says, don't you know anything? You have no idea what you're talking about. What you don't understand is that it's better for you that one man should die for the people so the whole nation won't perish. And not only for the nation, but sacrificially for the scattered ones that they might be gathered together as one people. You know that old boy prophesies without even knowing it? Out of even realizing the significance of what he said, that Jesus would die for the sins of the world. Now here's a truth that everybody needs to nail down. The messenger is nothing. The message is everything. The messenger is nothing and the message is everything. I've had people say, well, brother so-and-so led me to the Lord, but he's not even in the ministry. Well, brother so-and-so didn't save you, I trust. When I was in the grocery business, a man knew I was a Christian, owned a supermarket in West Texas, and he said, Butch, I'd like for you to meet my butcher, Jesse. I saved Jesse the other day. I said, I've seen some that I've saved too, but uh, the Lord does a whole lot better job. <laughs> if I was as lost as a goose in a hailstorm, and I read to you God's simple plan of salvation in Romans 10, and you heard the word... And the Holy Spirit convicted you of your need for Christ. And you called on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. 
Listen, you are saved by his word, his promise, his Holy Spirit, period. And the messenger, the mouthpiece, is nothing. It bothers me, but the Lord used the braying of an ass to get people's attention. <laughs> he used the crowing of a rooster to get Peter's attention. Amen. The Lord doesn't need me. The Lord doesn't need you. We need him. Yes. We need him Amen. and his word. Now, some just wanted him out of their life. In verse 53, from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. They just wanted Jesus and any reminder of him out of their lives. You remember when Jesus was about to be sentenced by Pilate? And Pilate says, I am innocent of this man. He tried to wash the blood off with, his, with the water in the basin. But he said, I'm, I'm free. I don't want anything. To, this, is, this is your responsibility. And they cried out, his blood be on us and upon our children. In other words, just get rid of him. Crucify him. Get him out of our life. Aren't you glad we're not like that? Really. Now when we have an oath... It's called for saying, so help me God. We've changed that. You don't have to say God. Because we don't want to offend you. You can affirm everything else. But you don't have to say, so help me God. So we're not trying to remove his presence from our society. We can take the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse. Because it reminds us that God is a God of absolutes. Amen. And so we don't want to be offended by that. So we pull it out of the courthouse. And we take prayer out of the schoolhouse. Because we don't want to encourage these innocent little children to pray to the one who created him. So we take it out of the schoolhouse. Let me tell you something. In Fannin Elementary on Houston Street, I'm not going to give you a date, but the streets weren't paved. Off. No. Uh, <laughs> and they tied the horses to the, no. <laughs> but you know what was the greatest thing for kids to look forward to in the first through the sixth grade? If they did well, if they listened to the teachers, if they turned in their homework, if they did these, they were chosen. And you know what they could do? Over the PA system, they could read whatever verse they wanted to in the Word of God, and they could lead in prayer. And they excelled, because just for the privilege of reading the Word of God before all of the student body, and being able to pray to the Lord Himself. Boy, we've come a long way, baby. You can take the Lord out of the courthouse and out of the schoolhouse, but you're not taking it out of my house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I don't want him out. I want him in. And some lose when they fail to choose. Verse 54. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews. Now listen to this. But went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. You've got to think about this long and hard. Here is something that may be hard for you to swallow. As much as I love America, um, God doesn't need America. America needs God. And even harder for me to grasp is that God doesn't need Texas. That's almost blasphemy. I had to get away from the pulpit just in case I wasn't right. But Texas needs God. And God sure don't need Marion. But Marion sure does need 
God. Well, what if Jesus said, I'm tired of dealing with you hard-hearted, stiff-necked, arrogant, politically correct people. I'm going to Australia. Better yet, New Zealand. I'm going to Brazil. Let me tell you something. He did it before, and he can do it again. He wasn't going to put up with their stiff-necked, hard-hearted, arrogant, politically correct attitude. And he says, I'm going to go to another country. And it may be near the wilderness, but let me tell you something. There's people there that love me. And he continued there, the Bible says, with his disciples. And he walked no more openly among them. We need, to, we need to realize that, folks. We're in a toilet bowl and we're waiting for the flush. Now, I know I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Forgive me, but it's true. We can't take more of what we've had. This country is lost and this country is hell-bound without Christ. And it is time for some preachers, and I'll start with the here. It's time for some preachers to start being prophetic and not being pretty. And being more concerned about thus saith the word of God than how they look when they go past a mirror. I've got, to chase, I, I've got to get this off my chest. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. I can't imagine some of these preachers putting their picture on a billboard. I tell you what, I, if, if I ever do that, I hope it's the day before you all get rid of me. Uh, I mean, what do you think? Oh, wow, look at him. I'm going to come. I mean, you all come to listen to Dave sing, and look at that. I mean, praise <laughs> Amen. You thought I was going to use myself, didn't you? No. I really believe, though, today, today, some preachers would have to use both hands to pull their tail out from between their legs. Not one hand, both hands. Just get it out and take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and take a stand for his word. And stake, take a stand on his promises. Take a stand on the fact that he is coming again. Take a stand on the fact that he's separating a people for himself. Take a stand. And then it'll flow to the pew or the chairs in this case. And every one of you need to take a stand wherever you're at. For years I labored under this passage in Ephesians that says let every man walk worthy of the vocation wherein he's called and if you're a songwriter then you be a good songwriter and if you're a worship leader you be a good worship leader and if you're a salesman be a good salesman if you're a teacher be a good teacher whatever it is walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called let me tell you something all of that is just to put beans on the table the vocation in which you're called is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as a soldier of the cross. Everything else is secondary. Well, some think that they can handle him by force. Now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if any man knew where he was, he should show it that they might take him. Wow. Ignorance has been raised to a level of acceptability. Every one of you here today is here by permission of Holy God. You're not here because Brother So and so invited you, Sister So and so asked you to come. Your neighbor said that they'd buy you lunch if you'd come. <laughs> You're here by permission of Holy God. Your next breath, your next heartbeat is by 
His divine will. Now think about that. If you realize that this morning, he's allowing you to take another breath. Your next breath is by permission of holy God. Your next heartbeat, kathump, kathump, kathump. Your next heartbeat is by permission of Almighty God. And what if he's allowing you the next breath? He's allowing you the next heartbeat. Thump, that you might have time to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Because one day the last breath will come. The last heartbeat will happen. And some believed and some, which one will it be? There's decisions that need to be made for Jesus today. Either for salvation, either those who are saved that want to identify, want to follow the Lord as a believer in bat scriptural baptism who are saved, identified, want to plant their life in the life of his church. But you're here by permission of holy God. The next breath, the next heartbeat is in his hand. Let's stand and pray. Father, we do thank you this morning for the attentiveness of your people. Lord, that they'd realize the importance of this time, this moment, to realize, Lord, that, that you're speaking to us. You're speaking to us. And right now we want to be still and we want to digest what you have spoken to us. Not what the preacher has said, but what the Holy Spirit of God has said when he took the Word of God and dealt with our hearts. Father, people here that are struggling, struggling with the matter of being saved. And the devil is in their ear and on their back. And he's saying, don't do it now. Don't do it today. Just wait. You still have time. Kathump, kathump. Today, Lord, the day of salvation, I pray that people would bow their heart, invite Jesus to forgive them, to come into their heart and life and save them. Father, there's people here that are saved. They know without a shadow of a doubt that they've been born again but they've never identified with your death, your burial, your resurrection, and followed you in scriptural baptism as a believer by immersion. Father, speak to their heart. For others who are questioning, Lord, is this the place where you'd have me to be to plant my life? Lord, let me have a word from you. Kathump. Kathump, kathump. May we make a decision today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you don't know where you will spend eternity, call Pastor Ivan. He will clearly explain how to be saved and know for sure that you are saved. God bless and have a wonderful day.